Well, good evening everyone. Let me welcome you to London School of Economics for this book launch um, this evening. Um, as you can see at the moment, we haven't got any books. Um, we're hoping the publishers will be here soon, um, working probably more to Cyprus time than all of us. But um, anyway, let's hope they get here soon. Um, thank you again for coming. Um, I thought when I put this together to sort of approach this in a, a rather different way than most book launches. And, I think, first of all, what I'd, I'd say is maybe just give you a little bit of background about this volume and, and how it emerged. It, it's really a project that I started working on about um, four years ago. Um, and if you cast your minds back to the situation, the talks had restarted in 2008, but by about 2010, 2011, they were back in the doldrums. And I think like a lot of people who've spent many years watching Cyprus, um, you know, I'm often fond of saying I'm, I'm not that old, but I've been following Cyprus now for almost 25 years, um, <clears throat> that this is like so many others. I, I was starting to ask myself, look, is there any way that this can be solved? You know, this has been going on so long, we've seen so many iterations, we've seen so many UN um, special advisors, special representatives, even secretaries general have come and gone. I, I believe that we're on secretary general number six now, trying to deal with Cyprus. And it just, one day I was thinking, you know, can Cyprus be solved? And, you know, am I, I surely can't be the only person who's asking this question. And so um, there was a very, very good journal called the Peace Review, which I don't know, probably most of you have never heard of it, but it's, it's a very interesting academic journal in that it doesn't publish traditional academic articles. It's very much um, essays, extended op-ed type pieces um, where academics but also practitioners can sort of expand their views on a subject in, in, without resorting to jargon and footnotes and things. And I thought this was a perfect vehicle. Um, so I put out a call for paper and approached a few people and said, look, you know, can you answer me this question? Can Cyprus be solved? And I said, look, think of it in this way. If you were in New York, if you were at UN headquarters, and you got into the lift and in walked the Secretary General. You had 10 minutes to make that elevator pitch. You know, this is the old play on the business um, elevator pitch. What would be the one, at most, two things that you would emphasize needed to be done? You know, what is it that, that really needs to have the UN's focus? Is it on some substantive issue, um, such as security, such as territory, or would it be about the process? You know, is there some sort of fundamental change in the way that the negotiations are handled? Or would it be about outcome? Do you have a particularly strong feeling about um, what the end goal should be? Should we ditch the idea of a bizonal bicommunal federation? Should we stick to it but maybe rethink it? Should we perhaps go for other options? Um, perhaps even partition? And then finally, what about outside actors? Are there other groups that could come in that could deal with it? So it was really a very open agenda, but I did emphasize to everyone, I don't want you to tell me about the Cyprus problem, and I don't want you to list everything. We all know what everything is. What I would really like to see, and, and here are your views on that one particular thing that you think could play a major part in, in, in unraveling this. And I have to say, the response was fantastic. Um, you know, I, I had only eight articles that I could publish in the issue, and I got many more than that. And so. Um, it was at that point that um, I'd had a long-standing cooperation with Ivy Taurus, um, and I know that they, they have a very strong interest in Cyprus, a strong commitment to, to publishing works on Cyprus. And so I went to them and said, look, you know, I, I published this special issue, but you know, I have a lot of overflow articles, which are just fantastic, and it would be a shame not to be able to include them. Um, but also I thought, you know, to, to widen the circle, to approach people who, who might have missed it first time, and um, this book is the result of that. Um, I'm pleased to say that in the end, I was able to gather together um, contributions from, from 30, I would say, leading observers of the Cyprus problem. Um, there were more that I approached who sadly um, felt unable to do it due to time constraints. And one of the things which I, you know, I want to stress quite right now, and this has obviously been a, 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 an important issue over the years, is the gender imbalance that very often exists um, on, on Cyprus talks. Um, replicated sadly a little bit this evening. Um, uh, Yeshim Harris, who was meant to be here, unfortunately passes her apologies. She wasn't able to, um, uh, to be with us this evening. But I'm delighted that uh, Robert Holland, Professor Robert Holland, um, 
who I, I approached before, but um, he, I think, had other commitments, but has managed to find a way to be with us this evening, which is, is, is wonderful. Um, and so the end product was this book, which hopefully will be available by the, by the end of um, the time everyone has spoken. Um, and it really is a, a, a fantastic contribution, if I may say so myself. Um, I was really delighted with the, the breadth of subjects that were taken. Um, there was very, very little replication that people really did stick to their, their task and produce what I think is a very rich volume, which um, actually does make a, a, a very good contribution to the debate. And I, I have to say sort of, um, that I was delighted to see that it was even mentioned in this week's Economist, which will be out tomorrow. Um, and, and it was highlighted there. The, um, the, the Europe editor, um, he said he might try and make it long this evening. He's a long standing, um, has a long standing interest in Cyprus as well. Um, and like many of us also, is rather concerned at where we are today. Um, you know, feels that, you know, is this a time that we open up this debate? And I really hope the book will actually be able to play a part in that. So really the way that I, I, I'm going to approach this evening is that, as you can see, there's rather a lot uh, of, of speakers. So rather than a formal presentation um, of, of, of just sort of going over their chapters and sort of speaking for, for 10 minutes each, I've really asked everyone to keep it to a very limited two to three minutes, just to sketch out um, their particular take on why they approach the subject they did in their chapter. And um, perhaps if they can, in, in, in as short a few words as possible, in order to give everyone a chance to, to come into this debate this evening, answer that question, can Cyprus be solved? So um, the first speaker I'm going to turn to is Dr. Amel Achali, who can is at the Central European... Before you carry on, can I make a remark? Um, I noticed that the Turkish Cypriot negotiator is present here, but I wonder why isn't the Greek Cypriot negotiator present, please? I spoke with a colleague about yours, uh, uh, about this precise issue. Um, every contributor to the book was asked if they would like to be with us this evening, whether they were here in, in the UK or whether abroad. Um, a couple were actually a, able to make it over from, from elsewhere. Amel has joined us very kindly from Budapest, and uh, Mr. Urban Olgan has come over from Cyprus. Um, I originally approached um, Mr. Olgan um, as a contributor to the book. Um, this was over two years ago, so long before his appointment um, as, as the uh, Turkish Cypriot negotiator, but obviously um, I think like many others, delighted um, that he was able to join us this evening. And so it was very much in that capacity. Um, had uh, Mr. Mavriannis been a contributor to the book, obviously the invitation would have gone to him. So I, I just wanted to make that point clear. This is, this is not, um, you know, this, this selection for the speakers this evening is solely the criteria that they were invited contributors to, to the book. And the book actually set out to bring in every dimension of the Cyprus problem, and all views were welcome in the book. That was made very clear in the original call to paper. I wasn't looking for people who all had the same views or who all came from um, a similar political background. It was very much to try and open up the floor as much as possible. So um, thank you for, for, for raising that point. It's obviously an important clarification for people. Um, if I may turn the floor over to Amel, who's joining us from Central European University. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, if so, so we have two or three minutes, so yes. all right, okay. Well, I, I actually was unable to answer this question, obviously, can the Cyprus problem so I mean, I couldn't give a direct answer, uh, but uh, I gave some, uh, I was a bit skeptic, I mean, my whole presentation uh, in this contribution, um, because I didn't think that at the moment when I was writing this, so it was almost two years ago, that the situation was ripe or the ordinary people were ready for this. I mean, my whole take on that, was that the ordinary people are quite separated and it seems like they want it that way. So, and then the negotiations were taking place and I think I contacted you by saying that, oh, maybe, you know, my contribution doesn't make sense anymore. Then, then I mean, things got reversed. I mean, so there was a fluctuation, a little bit of the situation. Uh, but uh, since we don't have a lot of time, I, what I mentioned is that why, since the situation is a little, was not right for me uh, uh, in terms of you know what the ordinary people are thinking, I was thinking that maybe it's time uh, to try to solve the problem from within. I mean, not to try to change it or to try to impose a kind of a different approach, but uh, let's see what the CPITs can do. Uh, I mean, just by uh, in, in the in the situation that exists at the moment. So uh, maybe this good neighborliness, I mean, they should try to become first neighbors first, and they should try to establish some relations and interdependencies between each other. I mean, just uh, in these existing conditions, and then let's see whether they can really live together or not. 
and this can actually create a, maybe a different vision of borders and different vision of understandings and identities, this creation of interdependencies. So this should actually precede the, maybe the formal negotiations. And uh, I have given, I mean, I had my PhD uh, thesis, I wrote my PhD thesis on the political geography of the partition of Cyprus. So I have given, presented my work as well about the, what, what are the mental representations of both sides. You know, I, you know, I carried eth uh, ethnographic field work on both sides of the Cyprus, of Cyprus in, uh, in 2004 and 2000, you know, between 2004 and 2006. So I was thinking that maybe we should concentrate on what are these territorial representations of people and uh, whether it matches, you know, we can actually have a more uh, progressive understanding of that in the future. And my PhD thesis findings uh, were that uh, Cypriots do not always, you know, sleep or wake up or always live with these representations that we have, like these official type of representations. They, they have different everyday practices about what the territory is, what the borders are, what the identity is, what the Cyprus actually represents for them. And I thought that maybe we can work on these type of representations of everyday practices and everyday representations and then try to create something new and some a kind of a different uh, relationship between ordinary people. And then this can maybe carry out, carry us to a place, I mean, or uh, help us get out of the impasse. And I think I should stop here because I already passed the two or three minutes. Right? I, can, I mean, I can, when there are questions, I can. The aim, obviously, is, is to open up discussion at the end of oh, this yeah. and, and for people to come but back and, and sort of okay lay, lay down just sort of their initial starting positions. Good stuff. Okay. Good. Um, Professor Robert Holland. Thank you. So I think four minutes or so. I, mean, I don't fit into James's um, in the lift with somebody so August as uh, Secretary General. I think I was brought in as a kind of cynical historian with, a, with, a, with a, a, a broad view rather than somebody who follows the details. And in that way, let me, state, let me state plainly the argument of the paper of the point. It's simply to say that the chances of a Cypriot-owned agreement, the details of which have been laboriously, um, laboriously thrashed out, is uh, zero, as most people, I think, will know, who follow it very closely over many years. However, solutions do come about in other ways. And that's what I discuss. And one of them at the heart of the paper is the sudden, how they come about more normally for Cyprus as a sudden, unanticipated consequence of external crisis bringing overweening pressures to bear. That's how it's happened in the past. That's, that's how it's happened in the past, and that's how it will probably happen in the future. Now, of course, um, Cyprus history, endless talk, Harlem Macarios in the 1950s, intercommunal talks after 1968, um, talks obviously since 1974 going on. Now you can define modern Cypriot political history almost in terms of talks. Harding said, and the metaphors are the same, time is on our side, saving faith, etc., etc., all the way back. Harding said in his time the talks failed because what was really going on underneath was a struggle for mastery. And that has not really changed. The reason why Greek Cypriots uh, turned down Anna was because of the perfectly sensible reason. The unconditional entry to the European Union appeared, however wrongly as it turned out, to offer a better outcome than Anna. So why go for it? Turkey Cypriots, so far as I know, have never accepted mere minority status with whatever protections. And we can see how the discussion about hydrocarbons is becoming subsumed in the kind of language of supremacism. Um, of course, analogies are made with Northern Ireland about a peace process. Quite a lot of that recently. I will abbreviate a paragraph and simply say the analogy doesn't work, does it, in many real way. In Ulster, there was an ongoing, daily, occasionally bloody, grinding, physical conflict. Um, and, of course, there was a deep yearning for an end to it amongst ordinary people. No such yearning exists in Cyprus. In Ulster, specifically in Belfast, there's a large, there was, there is a large middle class, spanning divisions, communal, religious, sending kids to the same schools, having the same reference points, leading the same lives. There's no overarching social process in Cyprus relating to our subject in the same way. <coughs> So how are struggles masterly resolved on the whole in history? Uh, sort that is of one side wins all, as on the American frontier, the Australian outback. Uh, well, one way, of course, is that they just disappear. 
in a fog of forgetfulness. Context change in ways that make the old struggle seem ridiculous, antidiluvian. Something of that is happening in Cyprus because of the economic crisis. Younger Cypriots are leaving the country in large numbers. Uh, and we were told yesterday that the economy will continuing, continue contracting through 2015 into 2016. Fresh discourses will inevitably take shape, are taking shape, that make the vocabulary and emotions of using the Cyprus problem, as we now understand it, simply marginal as the years go by. European history is littered with great bitter territorial questions. This is real hostile question. People can't even remember now what it was about. It simply evaporated in forgetfulness. But that's a matter for decades, even centuries. There's another genre of solution that comes about more abruptly, rudely, in fact brutally. And that's where external impulses cut across the situation and produce new reality. And in modern Cypriot history, that's how it's happened. That's how it happened in 1878, without going into details here. That's how it happened in 1914. That's how it happened in 1958-59, uh, when, of, when, of course, uh, uh, the, fear, the fear of another Greco-Turkish war, and then crises in the Lebanon, Syria, uh, Iraq, affecting Turkish security, which brought about the uh, move towards independence, that opened the path to that. So the argument then is not only that dispensations, new dispensations in Cyprus require inducements, encouragement from outside, of course they do, but they usually come about contingently, in the shadow of dramatic events elsewhere. Events which couldn't have been anticipated years before, and not even probably months before. And so my piece for James picked up on the rising tensions in the um, Eastern Mediterranean from 2005 to 2006 and onwards. Meanwhile, the book has been in the press. If anything, the point has uh, you know, become more relevant rather than diminished. One of my observations was how Cyprus is being caught up, was and is, uh, in a species of, 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 of real politique which has an old-fashioned Levantine feel to it. Foreign navies are developing a penchant to show their flag. Flag, flag. It's a, it's, a, it's a French aircraft carrier here, a Russian cruiser there. The Royal Navy is never far away. We all know about Russian uh, Turkish exploration ships, of course, and their escorts. Ships are all the rage again. And as for Adnan and Dareth, as for uh, uh, Tayyip Erdogan, he seems uncannily to exude all the characteristics of uh, poor old Adnan Menderes after 1958, though we assume he won't uh, experience the same fate. Uh, the authoritarian populism, the tetchy personality, the sense of being surrounded by enemies, external and internal, the same ebbing of an economy which had seen dramatic growth and then suddenly hit by setbacks and a sagging currency. Diplomatically, Erdogan has gone from claiming to, of course, to have um, zero problems with neighbours around him to having problems with virtually every neighbour around him. And indeed, yesterday, NATO's top commander, General Breedlove, uh, all too near to strange love, but General Breedlove, Breedlove uh, ha has warned that, in fact, the outcome of what's happening in the eastern Ukraine will be effective Moscow's control of the entire Black Sea. These are things that Turkey, even in sultanic times, always had to worry very much about. So it's invariably, it has been this in, the infusion of internal, external instability that generates a very force which in a sudden, profound crisis makes a new reality acceptable and even electable. So you can't predict the future, um, but none of the essential parameters for a, an internal solution appear to have changed. Uh, a more likely solution is just more of the same, a continuing partition, fading into uh, oblivion over a prolonged period until everybody gets used to it. But we cannot leave out of the equation the possibility of something more immediate and pressing, that a far bigger regional turn will suddenly transform calculations, push Cypriots and related actors together to act swiftly to keep the wolf from everybody's door. Whether or not that finally emerged in what finally emerges in that kind of scenario is simply the Anna plan, dressed up for politeness' sake to make it look slightly different, 
or not, one doesn't know. But a solution, that kind of solution, would be owned by nobody, and yet owned by everybody. And that's why it would probably last for a long time. Thank you very much indeed, Paul. Um, you know, Lozidis is joining us from the University of Kent. Um, I believe you've got your phone on. If it rings, um, it's not rudeness. His wife is very heavily pregnant. Um, could be any hour even. Um, so he's, he, he really, you know, I'm particularly grateful that he made it along this evening. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, James. And James approached me to work on this chapter. He has a question uh, as to um, uh, whether, can everybody hear me? Or do I need the, uh, I mean, that's, uh, that's Let's speak up. Uh, whether the Cyprus problem uh, could be solved. Uh, my answer was unreservedly yes, with no, uh, not a conditional uh, answer, and without uh, any hesitation whatsoever. And I based my argument on a twofold uh, argument. First, the experience of Cyprus uh, so far, uh, and then the experience of other divided societies, a comparative experience of other divided societies. What I mean by that, instead of trying to look at what happened in Cyprus, the failures uh, over the past uh, three decades, I uh, went as a comparativist and trying to identify any success stories uh, from Cyprus at different levels. And I look at five success stories that somehow challenge uh, the partition uh, narrative uh, in Cyprus. First, I look at the beginning, 1970s, how Nicosia has managed to survive an environmental disaster in the absence of a sewer system as part of the Lelos uh, Akinjim cooperation at the level of municipality. And then I look at the movement, uh, the Women Blegebizim movement, our homeland is uh, ours, and the mobilization of the Turkish Cypriots in the period before the Anan plan. Impressive. Uh, number of uh, demonstrations that occurred during this period, inspiring demonstrations that brought people together to support peace. Think of any other divided societies that something like that happens, people protesting for peace in such uh, large uh, numbers. Then I look at the level of village, uh, one of my favorite places, Cyprus Kormakidis, where the people started returning back as a result of a number of initiatives that took place in, uh, uh, in uh, 2000, about 2005, 2000, uh, six that demonstrate the desire of the displaced people to return back to their villages and the opportunities that might arise uh, to uh, have sustainable return uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, the northern part uh, of, uh, our, uh, of, uh, of our island. Then I look at uh, uh, the fourth case was uh, 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 the Committee for Missing Persons. Uh, which, according to Ban Ki moon, is one of the most successful biocommunal uh, projects uh, in the island. And uh, the degree we have managed uh, to um, exhume uh, missing persons uh, since uh, 2000, uh, 2013, to give you some numbers, numbers matter, even though it's not the full story. I recognize uh, this, and there are limitations in every in every success, in quote, success uh, story. Uh, in, in Cyprus and South Africa have almost the same numbers of missing persons, about 2,000 people. The much more celebrated case of South Africa, where the truth and reconciliation and a number of uh, initiatives that have taken place there, they have only 66 individuals that uh, uh, TRNC managed to, uh, TFC managed to, to exhume, in contrast to Cyprus, that the numbers, last time I checked, was uh, 941. So more than uh, 15 times uh, 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 bigger number. And the final story was a case of Democratic Rally, a political party uh, in the Greek Cypriot uh, side, with a very interesting history of uh, Kliridis bringing together after 1974 uh, the nationalist right, but also uh, the, 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 the liberals, and how a political party in our island has managed to transform and, up to 2004, uh, support uh, them uh, a, peace, uh, a peace process. Since 2013, obviously, uh, Anastasiadis uh, is uh, in power. So instead of looking at the, at the failures and thinking uh, how many United Nations Secretary Generals have managed to survive uh, as a stalemate, think of the success story, think of the Cyprus problem uh, uh, through this success as uh, a beginning, of, uh, a, beginning of, uh, of a peace process that we have made a number of, of, of progress points uh, through which we can learn useful lessons and we can build uh, for a sustainable settlement that could be 
on the benefit of, uh, uh, of uh, both sides. As a comparative, uh, we can draw a lot of linkages, a lot of lessons from these, uh, from these uh, cases uh, that I'm not going to bother you uh, with. I'm writing myself a, a book on this. But once you think in comparative uh, sense, then you can uh, draw from other cases as well. You can apply the same principle from other cases, and then you can think of what Cyprus can learn from other cases uh, as well. So to the question of whether the Cyprus problem could be solved, can we look at other problems around the world, South Africa, Northern Ireland, and compare them to the Cyprus problem to see whether these problems were much more uh, difficult to be resolved and compare the polls that were taking place in these countries and what people were predicting about Northern Ireland or South Africa before the settlement of those uh, cases as well. Uh, part of my chapter looks at a number of institutional innovations, not necessarily known to uh, most uh, Greek or Turkish Cypriots, but some of those innovations have been introduced to other cases and have been debated to Cyprus. Uh, to some, uh, to some, uh, to some uh, uh, extent uh, as well. So in a nutshell, uh, there is a ground of optimism uh, in Cyprus, despite the setbacks uh, that have taken place the last few uh, months. I know my view is controversial, uh, but uh, these, uh, these uh, achievements, Cyprus' own achievements, uh, could sustain a settlement, but also the availability of options can help us think of a different settlement, much different to the Anand plan, in my, uh, in my opinion. But this is a point we can return back uh, later on. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, the next speaker is Robert McDonald, who um, I think is a very familiar face to, to, to many people who are working on the region. Um, for anyone who doesn't know Robert, um, he actually has, well, he just informed me, he's been working on um, a, 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 an observer of, of Greece and Cyprus for, for over 50 years and was um, for many years the Economist Intelligence Unit um, correspondent for the region. Robert. Thank you, James. Um, my remarks are going to be rather sui generis. My contribution is, um, you may think some of the things I say are bizarre, fantastical. They may make you angry. If they do, I'm pleased because they at least made you think. I've looked at the Cyprus issue since 1963 when the constitutional order was destroyed by the Greek Cypriots and shattered in 1974 by the Turkish invasion. Um, the efforts since have been focused on trying to restore a version of the original power-sharing constitution, bizonal, bicommunal, with changes, bizonal, bicommunal federation with a single personality. We've been talking and talking and talking and talking about this, and none of it has worked. Years and years of cheese-pairing negotiations going over the same ground has led to the situation where we're, we're stymied. The, uh, the paper was written during the uh, Christophius Eroglu negotiations, which produced nothing. Then there were the Anastasia Eroglu contacts last year. We've had the uh, Anastasia Eroglu joint declaration in February this year. Nothing is moving. So I suggest we canvas some completely new ideas, wipe the slate, start from the beginning. Um, first, I suggest that we terminate the treaties of alliance and guarantee withdraw all foreign forces from the island, Greek and Turkish and British, and that the SBAs should be closed, should be uh, ceded by the British. Each community's National Guard should be disarmed and demobilized, and only a few of those might be maintained as an unarmed civil defense force to cope with natural disasters. The population should be disarmed make it illegal to own any weapons, including rifles, shotguns, and handguns. The state police forces have only sidearms and non-lethal weapons. So you say, what does Cyprus do for external defense? This could be assumed by the European Union under its program for synchronized armed forces Europe, SAFE. The sovereign base areas could be transformed from British SBAs to European, British, uh, Brit European uh, base areas. A Cyprus Standing Defense Force, CSDF, could be created with troop contributions from EU member states. <coughs> Turkish troops could not be included under this, so Greek troops could not be included. Maybe British troops could be included up to their proportion of their contribution to any European function. Uh, might be arguable that they should not be included, although their expertise <coughs> would be valuable. 
the CSDF could be financed by the Cyp Cyprus government from its domestic defense budget. It would probably have to exist for anything up to 20 years until sufficient confidence was built between the two communities, communities to create a Cyprus army. The UN can maintain the DMZ if it's willing, or the Cyprus Standing Defense Force could take it over. Then the Constitution. The division of populations is a fait accompli. So I suggest that what we look at is a confederal republic consisting of two largely autonomous constituent states, South Cyprus and North Cyprus, with complete separation, or almost complete separation of, of powers. The confederal government would be responsible for defense, foreign affairs, finance, health matters that are island-wide, transport, environment, energy, and heritage. The state governments would be responsible for all other quotidian matters, civilian security, civilian security, the police and fire departments, justice, courts, jails, and penitentiaries, local government, municipal and communal, education, primary, secondary, and tertiary, local health, doctors, clinics, hospitals, and pharmacies, social welfare, the land registry, spatial planning, onshore subsoil resources, agriculture, fisheries, industry, oversight of all services, including local banking and transport. Taxation would, and revenue raising would be a state power. The confederal government would be financed by subventions from the state governments equivalent to 40% of their revenues. If necessary, given the disparity in populations, a system of equalization payments might be negotiated. The states would have legislatures, and governments to be elected according to their own methodology. Whatever they decided would be their form of government. The confederal government would consist of ten members and be elected from national parties, that is, parties consisting both of Greek and Turkish Cypriots, in which political persuasion, conservative, liberal, and leftist, rather than ethnicity, would be the primary consideration. For the election of the president and vice president, the island would be a single constituency, if the front-running party happens to be led by a Greek Cypriot, then the vice president would be the head of the largest party held, led by a Turkish Cypriot, or vice versa. This would be the only concession to ethnicity as the basis for office. The eight cabinet ministers would be elected from four constituencies in the north and four in the south. All these trans-national uh, uh, groups, uh, all parties could run in these constituencies. Only locals in the constituent states could vote. Again, the results would be based on party politics and not on ethnic considerations. Finally, the question of property. Cash restitution for all lost property. The United States and other uh, Western powers have said that they would be willing to help finance a solution. Reckon it would cost about 15 billion pounds or euros, uh, the figures uh, vary, to exchange all the properties, for the Greek Cypriots to be reimbursed for all their properties in the north, the Turkish Cypriots to be reimbursed for all their properties in the south, and another five billion to build new housing for <coughs> incomers. Um, this could also be helped by aid programs from Greece and Turkey. There would be no prohibitions on rights of settlement or ownership. Thus, if over time, individuals from either side wanted to buy back their property, and it would probably be at a premium price, and live under a state controlled by another ethnic group, probably, then the present occupants should be allowed to return to their traditional holdings, provided they buy them back. The demilitarized zone and the sovereign base areas would, over that 20-year period of transition, gradually be given back to the nation. Thank you very much. <laughs> there we have a comprehensive um, settlement plan put on the table, which brings us very nicely um, to, to our next speaker, um, Mr. Mustafa Ergen Holgen, um, who really is someone who needs no introduction to, to you all as the current Turkish Cypriot negotiator. Thank you, James. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to write to this book again. Uh, the, the, my article was written about two years ago, uh, before I was appointed uh, to be the uh, negotiator for the Turkish Cypriot side. Please bear that in mind. Um, but even as the Turkish Cypriot negotiator, my task, which is to negotiate a 
um, federal settlement to the Cyprus issue based on the agreed principles of uh, uh, a bicommunal, bizonal uh, federation, uh, which in which uh, sovereignty will emanate equally from the Turkish Cypriots and Greek Cypriots, and in which uh, neither community can claim authority or jurisdiction over the other. That is my mandate as specified in the uh, joint declaration of 11 February 2014. Um, naturally, in negotiating uh, that solution, um, as we see today, uh, there are certain setbacks. And therefore, uh, one has to look into ways of overcoming those setbacks. And in doing that, uh, one of the things that uh, I and my uh, teammates, and some of them are here, um, look into the reasons why we have failed over 50 years of negotiation. Uh, was it about the process? Was it about the objective? Or was it about both? So um, in doing that, uh, we see that maybe times are changing. Maybe there are certain emerging factors, realities on the island and in the region to which uh, the process may need to be to adapt. And it may be time uh, to start thinking outside the box in order to address uh, the challenge that both Turkish Cypriots and Greek Cypriots are facing on the island. Of course, we come from the point that the current conflictual relationship on the island is not normal. That the Turkish Cypriots are, and uh, Greek Cypriots since 1963 have been, in, in their relations, are experiencing a normal situation. It's abnormal. And this needs to be regulated. We have to find a way of um, regulating it and make it a cooperative relationship because, in, in, in effect, we are all wasting a lot of energy, a lot of time, uh, a lot, and missing a lot of opportunities uh, which will never come back. So thinking outside the box may help us in finding new uh, creative ideas as to how we could move the process forward. And we look into other um, cases where we have had similar conflicts. In some of them, some of the ethnic conflicts that we have studied, we see that if there was no violence, the federal formula uh, would seem to be attractive uh, to um, uh, negotiate a cooperative relationship between the two uh, sides. In cases where there was some violence, uh, extreme violence, uh, the formula sometimes emerged to be um, that you divide and you, you go for uh, separate states for the, as we have seen in the case of Yugoslavia, uh, separate states for the uh, competing uh, nationalism in the equation. Um, in Cyprus, we, don't, we have not had any uh, violence since 1974, uh, and therefore uh, it was not pressing. But people, I mean, I am a pro nearly 70 now, uh, and uh, since my childhood, I have been, even I, have been uh, sort of occupied with the Cyprus problem. Uh, going to the English school in Stravolos, uh, I had to uh, go cycle there and on the way to the school, I was experiencing things that I didn't like. Uh, so why should our lives be, uh, in a sense, be preoccupied with such a thing? We need to find a way out of this. Uh, that needs to be negotiated. Thank God in Cyprus, uh, Turkish Cypriots have not uh, resorted to terrorism. Uh, they have tried to negotiate uh, with their Greek Cypriot counterparts. Uh, I remain in touch with my Greek Cypriot counterparts, uh, whom I have known uh, for more than 12 years under Andreas Maurianis. He was also in Mr. Kregelitz's negotiating team. Um, I visited his wife's uh, burial site. He's coming to my house for dinner, and we like to build up a bond between ourselves in our effort as the two negotiators to find a solution to the Cyprus problem, 
but we need to be creative. So the time may be, uh, may, may be ripe to start thinking a little bit outside the, outside the box, both in terms of the process and maybe in terms even of the objective, uh, to build a cooperative relationship between the two sides. My article is more or less about this topic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, from one old English schoolboy to another, um, Zeno uh, Stavridis here, who is a very familiar face to, to a lot of you as um, the, the former president of the Association of um, Cypriot Greek and Turkish Affairs. Zeno, thank you very much. Um, can the Cyprus problem be solved? Yes, just possibly. Will it be solved? Not in any way I can see. And the reason could very briefly, in fact it's a twofold reason. It has to do with the nature of the negotiating process and it has to do with the mindset of the negotiators and their teams and especially the leaders they represent and the communities whose ideas, beliefs, values provide the moral environment in which the negotiations or the negotiating moves of each side take place. Now, what is the nature of the negotiating process? Very briefly, it is what you might call, although this could be misunderstood, a free negotiation in the following way. You have two sides, the Greek Republic of Cyprus on the one hand, the Turkish <coughs> of the TRNC together with Turkey, which controls I think the basic moves in the negotiating process. And each side decides itself whether it's going to make a certain demand or whether it's going to react to the other side's demand by making a certain concession. There is no arbitration. Only once was arbitration, as far as I can tell, was used in the last uh, 40 years, and that's uh, the last phase of the Annan, the development of the Annan plan, and that was rejected by the Greek Cypriots. Um, so, you have, therefore, two sides, each of which decides whether to make a certain concession to satisfy the other side and demand uh, something which the other side will have to uh, uh, respond to. Now, it's important to understand that the two sides, the Greek Cypriot people on the one hand and the Turkish secret people and the Turkish government want how shall I put it? Justice. Want what's right for them. They don't ask themselves what's best for Cyprus in some abstract way. They are Greek Cypriots, they are Turkish Cypriots, they're elected by their own people. They promise them during the election campaign, this and that, which people recognize to be just things. And also, each of the two communities starts by being aggrieved because they believe that they've lost to the other side things which were important to them. This is what both sides want. And they hope that through negotiations they're going to get what is sometimes called a just settlement. Sometimes the terms is replaced by an acceptable settlement or a mutual acceptable settlement, but what's acceptable for each side is what it considers to be juster than the present situation. So the Greek Cypriots want their refugees to go back home. They want, just as they were before 1974, they want to go back to their properties. They want to restore the unity of the territory, the unity of society, the unity of the economy. That was a new one. I, but I remember Tassos Papadopoulos mentioning this. In effect, they want to get as close as possible to the pre-'74 
situation. But tell the Turkish Cypriots we'd like to get got as far as possible to the pre-1974 situation. And they're going to be very upset. If you think they're not going to be upset, try it on Ergun Olgun. Because they believe that from 63 to 74, they have been dealt great injustice by the Greek Cypriots. And therefore, they think that that was a very bad period for them. But even after 74, when they gained complete security from Greek Cypriots, a contiguous territory which they can call their own, they are calling it their own, because the Greek Cypriots are disputing this, and all kinds of other goodies. Nevertheless, they still feel that the other side is depriving them of important things. The Greek Cypriots feel that they are being deprived of the freedom of their country. The Turkish Cypriots feel they are being deprived of the recognition and other things that go with recognition. So if, therefore, you have free negotiations where each side wants something from the other side, which the other side considers to be important for their security, their uh, safety, their welfare, their vitality, then you realize that you are not going to get anything unless you give something yourself. This has been the reason why negotiations haven't made any progress from 1977 <coughs> until now. Uh, James reminded us that there have been six secretary generals of the UN who have been involved in the Cyprus problem. That's all of them besides uh, Trikman Lee, I think, the first Norwegian UN secretary general. Hammer Schultz as well, didn't huh? well, he? Might have Hammer. Hammer Schultz in the modern incarnation, yeah, but he right. did actually have a bit, if you consider before okay. 1960. Yeah. But what I want to say is that there have been 15 or more, probably, I haven't counted them, special representatives of the UN Secretary General in Cyprus, and the last of them, Mr. Radaide, was saying two days ago that he's been very disappointed because his proposals for uh, toning down the crisis in the Republic of Cyprus's exclusive economic zone have been rejected, certainly by the Greek side, and not just the president, the president plus his ministers plus the, uh, the National Council. And I think that Mr. Zeroglu, Mr. Zeroglu has rejected it. Or am I mistaken? No, not rejected, but uh, worth working on. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, see, you see, Ergun's superiority to me. No. He's a diplomat. Um, now, I'd like to say one more thing. None of the two communities, unlike probably the two communities in Northern Ireland, are desperate, destitute, frightened. They still have things in their community, in their lives, which they value. They are their assets. The Greek Cypriots have the Republic of Cyprus is a state which is older than many of the new states in the United Nations. It's a member of the <coughs> European Union. It's a member of the Council of Europe in all kinds of organizations. The Greek Cypriot politicians are able to argue their case in all kinds of international fora, and that gives them a sense of importance setting to the politicians and the officials. The Turkish Cypriots have, of course, despite the fact that they feel very frustrated for being unrecognized, complete security, which, and they certainly don't want to go back, and no Greek Cypriots have suggested that they go back to the situation that existed for them before 74. So it seems that Greek Cypriots and the Turkish Cypriots think roughly in the following terms. I want justice. I want to get from the other side certain things which are going to ameliorate my situation. But they are reluctant to give me what I believe is mine as a matter of right. And on top, they want something which is mine anyway. That is, 
What I'm demanding is mine uh, as a matter of justice. I've lost it when you usurp from me. But what they want from me is again mine too. And so if a choice has to be made by each of the two communities, by the, by the majority of the people, shall I give up what I have in order to get, or some of what I have in order to get something from the other side, I think they think that they're better off keeping what they have. And I believe the two communities have come to accept the situation as it is. Try to understand, because this is easy to, uh, what I've said can easily mis mislead. I'm not saying that they will declare their satisfaction to the situation as it is. I'm saying that life goes on, shopping, houses, work, wages, holidays, and so on, on both sides. And I think that they've come in that passive way to accept it as long as they're willing to say, to, is willing to complain and declare their undying uh, determination to fight for justice. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sinon. Um, I'm delighted to be able to welcome someone who I think is a, a, a newer face to um, the, the Cyprus issue, um, Dr. Bertie Burger. I'd also like to extend congratulations. Um, she just received her PhD last month. So oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh. Beata wrote a, a, a chapter with a, a very old friend of mine who is also a long-time Cyprus um, watcher, Professor Oliver Richmond, um, but delighted to have um, Beata speaking this evening. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, and our book chapter, as you said, is um, co-written with Oliver Richmond. Um, we might have turned around the question a bit in the beginning, and we said, well, can Cyprus be solved? But actually, is Cyprus solved somewhere? Um, and we found that it's particularly on the ground, uh, on the local level, on the citizen level, there have been a, a lot of solutions over the past years. Um, so we think that there might already be some sort of a solution on the local level that we could focus on a bit more. Um, that is why we suggest in the chapter that instead of focusing on the state level all the time, um, it might be worse to have a look at the bicommunal movement, the civil society movements that arose from that, um, and the many citizens group that are in Cyprus and that have found ways of um, maintaining pluralism and um, kept communication lines often open um, and f brought some sort of a, a Cypriot identity. Um, so basically what I want to suggest is um, that the debate has to change a bit from the state level um, to the local level uh, because we have seen over the past years that um, despite peacekeeping uh, peacekeeping interventions um, UN interventions EU governance reforms shuttle diplomacy and so on and so forth um, the elite level of Cyprus has not been able to reach a well any progress um, or notable progress towards um, a comprehensive settlement over the years Sorry. Um, <laughs> so Instead, we saw what was happening on the ground. Um, and if you look at the Cyprus, um, at the at the Cyprus bicommunal movement, um, they started in the 1990s um, to to open to reopen um, communication between the different sides of Cyprus, despite closed borders. Um, and there seem to be many solutions that have been brought forward over the years. Uh, for example, I, I had an interview with someone from the bicommunal movement from the early days. He said, like, um, what was later the Anand plan was in, in big parts discussed in the Balkan movement already in the mid-1990s and has been brought forward um, as part of, like, discussion papers and so on and so forth. So there seem to be um, possibilities to find a locally accepted um, way towards peace. Uh, what we don't want to suggest, or what I don't want to suggest, is that we know what the solution to the Cyprus problem is. So we don't suggest it in the book chapter. Um, but maybe what we're saying is if the Cyprus problem is to be, is to be solved at some point, um, the political discourse needs to be relocated to those who have long, well, actually put it forward. 
And um, in the current, um, for example, joint statement, again, there's missing a part of uh, what civil society has to say on the Cyprus problem. So maybe that's worth relocating and refocusing on in the future. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. <laughs> um, our final speaker of the evening is uh, Kliakos Kyriakides, who again is, um, I think, a, a, a well-known face to, to many of us who, who've been working on, on Cyprus. Um, Kliakos is uh, a lawyer. A are you still practicing? No, you don't, but you're a qualified solicitor, but lecturer in law up at the University of Hertfordshire. Um, Kliakos. Thank you, James. Can I first of all begin by thanking... Uh, James for editing this new book and for inviting me to contribute a chapter. Uh, my contribution to the book dwelt on the rule of law, a concept which is neither adequately understood nor properly applied in the Eastern Mediterranean. My uh, themes uh, in the, um, the chapter were all advanced and composed over the Christmas period in 2012. Uh, quite a lot has happened since then, but the broad thrust of what I've written um, remains valid today, at least in my view. I'd just like to make three um, uh, points today in the limited time available. The first is that the, the rule of law is the foundation of the United Nations, the European Union, the Commonwealth, the Council of Europe, and indeed this country, England, which has provided the legal foundation for the Republic of Cyprus. Alas, the rule of law is missing from the Cyprus question. The politicians and the diplomats treat it as an inconvenience, and regrettably, the negotiators seem to want to create a new rule of law, in inverted commas, which subverts the Western, liberal, democratic, and indeed European perception and approach to the rule of law. Turkey is the occupying power in the uh, Republic of Cyprus. It occupies the northern part of Cyprus because of an invasion which was unlawful, an ethnic cleansing which was unlawful, and a colonization which is unlawful. The law has been overlooked. Turkey has been allowed, for reasons to do with the Cold War, uh, in earlier years and for other reasons in more recent years. Turkey has been allowed to get away with its rampant uh, violations of international law and indeed European human rights law. And to cap it all, to capital, Turkey has still not ratified a host of international treaties. And I, I would advance this argument that there cannot be any settlement of the Cyprus question unless Turkey ratifies legal instruments such as the uh, Convention on the Crime of Apartheid, 1973, the additional protocols to the Geneva Conventions of 1949, the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, 1982, the Rome Statute on the International Criminal Court, 1999, and the Convention for the Protection of All Persons from Enforced Disappearance, 2006. Why has Turkey not ratified all of those treaties and a host of others? Why has Turkey not implemented uh, judicial decisions such as that of the European Court of Human Rights in the case of Varnava and Turkey, which confirmed that the rights of the, the human rights of the missing persons and their relatives had been violated. If Turkey cannot respect judicial decisions today, and if Turkey cannot subscribe to the cornerstones of international law today, what prospect is there of a settlement in the future, or indeed the implementation of any settlement in the future? My second proposition relates to the proposed transformation of the Republic of Cyprus into a so-called bicommunal, bizonal federation consisting of two politically equal communities. Any such outcome, any such federation, would be legally dubious, morally wrong, and I'm pleased that Xenon referred to the moral framework, because that's been missing in this equation, would be morally wrong, spiritually soulless, out of line with the founding principles of the European Union, which promote equality, diversity, inclusion, and related principles. And it would also be incompatible with the multi-ethnic realities in present-day Cyprus. We keep on hearing about two sides, two communities, two leaders. There is one community in a liberal, democratic, sovereign state with multiple ethnic and religious strands. 
And the first thing that we need to do in Cyprus is discard the notion that there are two communities. We have Armenians, we have Latins, we have Maronites, we have Filipinos, we have British citizens living permanently and lawfully in Cyprus. We have Irish, we have Poles, we have Ukrainians and Russians. We must change the mindset of uh, Cyprus and speak of one community with multiple religious and ethnic strands. Because that is what Western liberal democracy is built around. Look at the United States of America. Look at Australia. Look at this country. Walk down the Aldwych or go up Holborn. Everybody is equal under the law. Groups should not be given enhanced rights. There should be no institutionalised racism in favour of Greek Cypriots in the south and Turkish Cypriots in the north. Every individual citizen, irrespective of race, religion, or non-race or non-religion, and we have atheists in Cyprus, everybody should be treated equally under the law, and everybody should be given an equal opportunity under the law. And what is most nauseating of all about this immoral basis that is the framework for the discussion is the stench of segregation. The idea that we must segregate people on the basis of their race or their religion, with Turks herded up in the north and Greeks ethnically cleansed from the north and herded into the south, going back to 74. The United States of America at the moment is marking the 50th anniversary of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the granting of the Nobel Peace Prize to Martin Luther King. He campaigned for racial justice, for equality under the law, and for the removal of the lingering elements of slavery and segregation which contaminated American politics during the 20th century. And that's what we need to do in Cyprus. We need to adopt the principles of Martin Luther King and remove any notion of segregation and racially based restrictions on movement and settlement and the acquisition of, of property. All segregation statutes Martin Luther King teaches us distort the soul and damage the personality. This is what's happened in Cyprus. The politicians have contaminated the politics, partly through Turkey's misconduct. We need to ensure that the principle of equality and the rule of law prevail. And my third and last submission relates to the procedures which have been adopted with a view to settling the, the so-called uh, Cyprus question. The peace processes have been conducted in secret by politicians operating behind closed doors with no consultation with the lawful uh, citizens and other residents of the Republic of Cyprus. There has been no meaningful public participation in the form of consultation exercises, in the form of, of uh, transparency, in the form of disclosure of, of draft, legal and constitutional texts. The political leaders in Nicosia are operating a cartel. They want to cling power and retain power and dispense patronage and they're operating in a way that is contrary to the English approach which is predicated on, on open justice and transparency. So to sum up, and I'm, I'm being invited to wind up, to sum up, ladies and gentlemen, Cyprus is situated next door to Syria where we have the biggest humanitarian catastrophe in the world taking place. It's situated next door to Iraq and Syria where we have a racially based unrecognised state that has sprung up in the last few months, which bears some of the similarities to the unrecognised racially based state, in inverted commas, in the Turkish occupied north. Are we going to build a constitutional future of Cyprus on race and religion and division and segregation, or are we going to cling on to the cherished principles of the rule of law and justice and freedom and equality, in which the two sides are not the Greek Cypriots and the Turkish Cypriots, but the citizens and the state. I rest my case. I knew there was a reason you were, you, you were going to arrive late to, to have that final, final word in, in, in this particular part. Um, we now have about 25 minutes um, to, for people to pose questions. Um, I'd also like to hear comments, but please, please, please keep them very short. Um, you know, the, the, I'm sure there's a lot of people who've got things to say. You know, there's been a fantastic diversity of opinions presented tonight. So, as I say, please keep comments short. And, if, and perhaps if you could identify yourself as, as well. Can we start with the first question? Yes. 
start by voting Blair for president, please. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm somewhat disappointed that for a book that is meant to look, be looking at resolution and going forward, I, I'm surprised that a number of people who kept going back to the so-called Annan plan that was voted out because it wasn't based on the rule of law and because it was based on segregation. Can you comment on that, please? Is there anyone in particular you would like to aim that to? Not really. There were, there were so many people that mentioned it, and that was what was very disheartening for me, with actually a, a, a finger of blame, that's how it came across, a finger of blame pointed to the Greek Cypriots. Okay. So if you can have a reply from two or three, I'd like to hear a variety of people well, what I'll do is I'll take who have the need. So people can note down and then yeah. pick on which particular subjects that they, they, they feel um, they'd like to comment on. Um, Bernard. I'd like to comment at the beginning about the sewage system, um, which is also important. I am a visitor and I've done bits of work there. I used to live in Berlin when it had a wall around it and a border across the middle. And the one thing which has pleased me about going to Nicosia is the way in which you can cross the border and even could cross the border in the bad old days. There was a damn sight easier than it ever was in Berlin in those bad old days. There was a little bit of progress there. And I embrace that. Okay. Uh, gentleman behind. Um, hello there, my name's Sir Ken, I'm from the University of Oxford. Um, I'd like to uh, direct my comments to the gentleman that last spoke. Um, my comment is that you're forgetting that the only reason why the Republic of Cyprus recognised a legitimate title holder as all the territory of Cyprus is all down to the wording of the document in 1964. Turkish Cypriots have been governing themselves in the island since 1963, way before that document referred to the government of Cyprus. Now, you could use all the legal technicalities you can against us because it serves your interests, but it's not working at all. If you approach the Cyprus problem in a 100% legalistic manner, you're not going to have any success. My name is Nicolas, I'm an MSc student, uh, economic student at the LSE. Um, basically, we all know uh, Turkey's uh, attitude to, uh, towards foreign uh, matters. Um, basically, this is stated explicitly, these strategies are stated explicitly in Ahmed Abudoglu's book. Uh, recent evidence is uh, that, as we now discuss, there is a Turkish ship in Cyprus waters searching for oil. My question is the following. How do you think, um, can we solve the problem when Turkey does not even recognize the, sovereign, the sovereignty of the Republic of Cyprus? Thank you. Yes, no, I realize there's a lot of people who want to, so I'm just trying to work my way some sort of order. Uh, hello, my name is Suleyman Sama from the Cyprus High Commission. Uh, it's just a question for Mr. Ogyun. Um, is this one? Yeah. yeah. Uh, he, um, he referred to uh, his mandate emanating from the uh, joint declaration of the 11 February 2014, uh, but at the same time he referred to uh, create, creative ideas, thinking outside the box. Um, if he could elaborate a little bit on um, what these ideas might be, and if that means um, thinking outside the box means uh, uh, ditching the 11 February 2014 joint declaration and going um, in another direction. Thank you. What is your position on today's situation with Turkey violating in such a provocative way the exclusive economic zone of Cyprus and to 
to what extent you accept the results of the negotiations between the ex-president, Mr. Christophus, and Mr. Kalat? I will draw it to a close just for this session. Hopefully we can then get one more round. Um, what I'll do is I'll just work down the table. So, Neo, if you'd like to sort of pick up on any of the points that you've heard. Yeah, a uh, few points. Uh, can we solve the Cyprus problem in the presence of provocations from any of the two sides of violation you mentioned? That's one of the reasons we have to solve it. Because in the absence of a settlement, if these provocations continue, there might be an incident in the future very similar to what happened in the 1990s and the 1980s with the territorial uh, waters and the crisis in uh, uh, Nigeria between Greece and Turkey. We have a history in the Cyprus problem. For every decade, we have at least one near-war situation, if you look to the 1950s and onwards. We're extremely lucky we didn't have one the last decade, but there's no guarantee given the pattern of having at least one near-war situation every decade, that this pattern will not be repeated uh, in the future. On the dilemma between being pragmatic or legalistic, my analysis of the cases I have looked at, the success stories, in quotation, the limitations I recognize, we have seen relative breakthroughs in cases where we combine the legal and pragmatic principles in conflict resolution. There's no reason why we should be depriving us from the full panoply of different approaches that uh, we need to resort uh, to when we're addressing uh, the, Cyprus, uh, Cyprus, uh, the Cyprus problem. We can <coughs> insist on your legal principle that doesn't prevent you from being pragmatic uh, at the same uh, time. On group differentiated rights, whether this is a form of uh, institutional racism, uh, some forms of group rights are uh, disputable, and we have cases in the European Court of Human Rights that justify the position. At the same time, we have consociations and group differentiated rights in a number of cases. Uh, across uh, across uh, across Europe, Northern Ireland, look at uh, uh, South uh, South Tyrol. We can discuss those cases. We can discuss those cases, and we could have an arrangement that is at the same time consociational and liberal. We have done work on that, and we can debate uh, that point uh, at uh, at uh, at a great uh, at a great uh, at a great. Uh, um, uh, at a great, uh, at a great level. There is a reason why group differentiated uh, rights are important, and this is partly because of uh, history. If you try to deprive uh, a community uh, of its historic rights, that creates a number of further complications uh, that, in the case of Cyprus, uh, might mean. Um, uh, might mean uh, partition itself. And I will leave the last, uh, the last point. There is a lot of discussion. Uh, with my uh, Greek Cypriot uh, uh, compatriots on uh, whether we are unlucky to be dealing with um, uh, uh, Turkey and the Turkish, uh, Turkish Cyprus. Of course, there are complications. These have to be uh, recognized. And the history of Cyprus problem uh, is very bad. But imagine if you had uh, a choice to be born again. And having to choose, uh, uh, you can't choose a place where you can be uh, born, but you can choose your enemies. You can choose whether you can have the Israelis, the Houthis, the Ulster Unionists, the Tamil Tigers, uh, or the Turkish Cypriots. Uh, what are you going to be your choice? So we're dealing with a difficult side in the negotiation, obviously, but at the same time, we're not dealing with the most complicated uh, uh, case. Uh, uh, there have been cases in other divided societies, and I uh, I very much agree with the point that we need to look at creative solutions uh, from, uh, from elsewhere that, uh, that can inspire us. Um, how can we do that? We need to find cases where the problems have been equally or more difficult compared to Cyprus. So there were difficult cases. And then institutional solutions were negotiated among sides with a history uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of conflict. The institutional design 
managed to address the complications. So we can go and talk to our people and say, look, there has been a solution there of a similar problem that has been uh, that has been uh, that has been introduced. We need to provide examples uh, that this has happened, and then take the same ideas and adapt them to the context of cyber. We're not going to just import without uh, uh, considering the context of cyber. We would implement those ideas to our context. And our it is you're dealing with human beings here. You're dealing with human beings. It's not a hypothetical uh, fact. Human beings, the citizens of the public society. Focus on that. Not let me, hypothetical. Let, let, uh, I'm not hypothetical at all. Uh, oh, yes. No, no, no. no, no, no. I'll, I'll, tell, I'll, I'll, tell, I'll tell you please, why. Please, please. Allow, allow, allow the, the others point. to comment. Uh, it's, it's an interesting point. I'll <laughs> let, but no more. Can I have a got, ten, yes, ten second to, answer? To, to respond to that, because I know this is something that, that, that often comes up. The people of Cyprus would vote in a referendum to resolve this, I, this problem. So the ideas will be tested in a democratic fashion. Well, they have been tested in 1990. No, have been tested in the amount of time. He, he makes the point. Robert. 2004. The only yes. point that I would address in all of this is Anand. And Anand did provide, I'm a, as you would take from my presentation, I'm a pragmatist. Anand did provide a solution, flawed as it was. It was rejected by the Greek Cypriots, which was the most disgraceful thing they possibly could have done. They could have accepted it, That's your worked opinion. with it. That is your opinion. That's why I'm on the so platform and you're not, mister. Uh, <laughs> well, excuse me, I'm it a was, When am I going back? It was... It, well, I'm a refugee from the village of Akna. When am I going back? Can you tell me Anand, that? You Anand, Anand, Anand would have created... No, you tell me now. Anand would have created oh, a series of... Rubbish. Institutions yeah, which were gradually at the Greek Cypriots. Rubbish. Have you read it? Stop this talking about like like you. Like people like you who are not helping this. Look, can you please sit down? Yeah. That's a provocative way. When you find the majority of the Cypriot people said no. That means no. He's allowed to make his views known. But not please. to call us Crazy. And, and that's disgusting, Mr. Chula. That's disgusting. That's the wrong word to use. And we create institutions within which both communities could have worked to reunite over time. Thank you. Please. Who vote for their country? Look, there was an opportunity to raise questions, all right? ML. Yeah, I, I just want to say something. <laughs> okay, uh, just one short point about uh, the liberal democracy that you also mentioned that I think that yes, there is, I mean, you also say why do we stick to the Annan plan? Well, the Annan plan is just 2004, but this liberal democracy is much older and we still stick to that. And we're now in our world that we live, I mean, we go towards some other solutions. It's not just one, you know, we have pluralist democracies with a multiculturalism that have been tried in different countries. So this whole idea about, I don't find it like two communities, many communities or federation or whatever, is not uh, uh, just to put it like it's a racist and it's a segregation. I find it quite limited actually. I mean, we don't need to stick to this whole one idea, one citizenship, one whatever as the solution. This is a very old idea. I mean, I would say old fashioned idea. Of course, that it is very multicultural society. We should find more creative ways in order to solve the problem in Cyprus now <coughs> and not stick to that one. Even in Turkey now, uh, now, uh, the Turkey is going through, I mean, it has a lot of you know, democracy deficits, but it's going through this uh, peace process with the Kurdish community, and it is trying to enlarge the limits of liberal democracy, that Turkey should not be based only one citizenship and one ethnicity, and there we are to, I mean, this whole process, whatever, you know, the problems that it has, it is actually the, the, the society in Turkey is discussing whether there should be more autonomy given to the Kurdish uh, population on the basis of ethnicity, on the basis of territory and all that. So, but this is not just, this is a way to be able to solve ethno-territorial problems. And if we stick to the idea and if we try to uh, promote to the population that this is racist, this is segregation and all that, of course people are going to stick to that idea. And, you know, people, I mean, we are going to have conflict. Uh, this is why I think the we need to get out of that. But don't oh, cut please. me off, please. Don't cut me off. I mean, this is a secret problem. Uh, but uh, please, listen. Learn to listen. Okay. Uh, James, and that's sorry. it. Can you Thank ask you. your your panel to clarify? Yes, please. I mean, let's, let's. They are trying. So please, can we just 
let, let them respond to the questions as they, they see fit. We've given people a chance to ask the questions, and they're, they're, they're answering them. That's it. Well, uh, I'll, maybe I'll respond to the first point that uh, Aliki Paris made, which is, how is that we are here to address the question how the Cyprus problem can be solved, which you thought is the topic of the book. The topic of the book is, can the Cyprus problem be solved? One can take the no answer, one can say well, a, a yes answer, or yes under certain circumstances, etc. Now, we talk about thinking outside the box, somebody said, because certainly those who think within the box, obviously haven't solved all these years. Sorry, sorry, Zina. Mm -hmm. I couldn't hear the last word you said. Sorry. I said those people who have been thinking within the box, or within the boxes, there are two boxes, aren't there? Yeah. Have not been able to, to solve the Cyprus problem. And if you think a lot, I mean, a lot outside the box or far outside the box, then you leave the people behind because both sides have democratically accounted, accountable leaders responsive to public opinion. I'm not saying that each of the leaders always, uh, always has the support of everybody. I mean, does Anastasia has the support of everybody? But uh, as long as the process chosen for the solution of the Cyprus problem are these negotiations to which no superior authority, they say Secretary General or the Security Council, takes part and imposes a view that it considers to be fair, then the process itself will give decisive say to the leaders of the two communities who think within the box, because their own people think within the box. For every Greek Cypriot, like the gentleman who left, there is a Turkish Cypriot who is very strongly, but on the other, other side of the, within the another box. Greek and Turkish Cypriots are very passionate when they talk about these things. But I think that there have been some uh, surveys, uh, public opinion surveys, and they have shown that most Greek Cypriots, at least, probably 55%, don't think the Cyprus problem is going to be solved. Thank you. Thank you. Let me start by saying that both communities in Cyprus have suffered. We have to acknowledge that Greek Cypriots have suffered. Louder than this. I think we have to acknowledge, I said, that both communities in Cyprus have suffered as a result of uh, the conflict of Cyprus, that uh, both the Greek Cypriots and the Turkish Cypriots have suffered. And because of that suffering, there are different, two, two distinct narratives of the suffering. I do not think that we can impose any one of those narratives over the other. We have to find a new visionary narrative for Cyprus. We have to look ahead. We cannot simply concentrate on one interpretation of history and, and simply try to build something on that. Uh, reference was made to the rule of law. There is another interpretation of the rule of law that I don't want to go into because it would not be constructive um, on the Turkish Cypriot side. But as I said, we cannot simply talk about the past. The past is past. We have to look ahead. And as Turkish Cypriots and Greek Cypriots sharing the island of Cyprus, we have to find something to make our relationship constructive. Like I have done with my individual Greek Cypriots, we have to do it collectively with the, within the communities. We cannot simply be victims of history, continue, continue to be victims of history. We have to learn how to forgive and to ask for forgiveness. And this is the key. This is the key to resolve our differences. We have both committed mistakes. We have to acknowledge that. And therefore, I mean, my answer would be to look ahead. I am prepared to forgive and I am prepared to ask for forgiveness. I can do it. If, I can, if we are all prepared to do it, it will be a tremendous change for Cyprus and we will unlock the door 
for working together. Now, there were some specific questions. On the rule of law, I think I have mentioned, uh, just simply to touch on that, the 1960 agreements for so two communities. It was built on the fact that they had two communities on the island. The state of affairs created at that time did not allow one of the communities to rule over the other. There were some unchangeable provisions of the Constitution where which were changed unilaterally in 1964. As far as Turkish superiors are concerned, that is a violation of, Turkish, of, of, the, of the rule of law. I don't want to go into all these things because it's not going to help us. Um, as I said, we have to look ahead. Now, how can we solve the problem without the, without the recognition of the Republic of Cyprus by Turkey? As I said earlier on, for the Turkish Cypriots, there are, as I, there are two different narratives. The Turkish Cypriot narrative is that the Republic of Cyprus was hijacked and usurped by the Greek Cypriots in 1963, December 1963. Therefore, recognition of the Republic of Cyprus by the Turkish Cypriots and Turkey would mean accepting and legitimizing that usurpation. We cannot do it. Thinking outside the box, whether this is uh, going beyond... So, Kun, can I just ask a simple question? Yes, sure. If that is the case and you do not recognize the Republic of Cyprus, then why has the Republic of Cyprus accepted the Turkish Cypriots as citizens of the Republic of Cyprus and that all citizens of the Republic of Cyprus have the rights of freedom of movement in the whole of the island? The Turkish Cypriots have the rights to our national health, to everything. If you don't want to be part of our country, then don't be citizens of the Republic of Cyprus then. You can't have it both ways. Correct? So you don't accept us as a, as a sovereign nation, but you want to be part of it and hold our EU passports. The Greek, the Republic of Cyprus... You, 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 hold on. No, you, I, I think the point's made, and in Thank fact, you. you can draw interesting parallels. You know, we had a very similar situation in this country with Northern Ireland in, in, in actual fact. I, I think you'll, you'll find that there were people who rejected the sovereignty of the state, but... That's different. It's, it's different, but there are interesting it's parallels. It's not just to be a Cyprus. Very but it would be interesting to hear a response to that. The Republic of Cyprus, as it was established in 1960, was a bicommunal republic. The fact that the Greek Cypriots are controlling today does not authorize you to claim those rights over Turkish Cypriots. That's not I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not going to comment anymore on your question. That's incorrect. Well, it's to you, it may be. Now, uh, as far as, as, far as uh, the joint declaration is concerned, the Turkish Cypriots are Sir, uh, fully bound by the joint declaration, and uh, we are at the table, negotiating table, to continue uh, where we have left, uh, and we are expecting the Greek Cypriots to come to the negotiating table. <coughs> um, Turkey violating the EEZ of uh, the Republic of Cyprus. The island of Cyprus is co-owned by the two communities, including its resources. The Turkish Cypriots have not authorized the Greek Cypriots to act on their behalf regarding those resources. We are exercising our right to that property. That's why we are there. And Turkey is our guarantor. Can Convergences regarding the convergences. Minister of for Europe, <laughs> David Livington, today. Please. So David Livington today. We know what the response is going to be. Thank you. We know, we know. Let's talk about facts. No, please. Look, we, we, we're, we're almost. I, I think we know that this is not going to take us forward. That there's a position that, that you have. You know what the answer is going to be. It's been made very clear. Well, so, must, um, Mr. Ogden, if you have, must, would like to move on to yeah, next. Yeah, next, next question. Uh, the status quo is 
said, even in UN resolutions, not to be acceptable. The status quo needs to be changed. We have committed ourselves in the joint declaration to move to power sharing. Power sharing necessitates beyond the word deeds on the part of its signatories. We expect respect for the oath given in the, tw in the, tw in the 11th February 2014 commitment to be put into practice. That's why we are demanding that we act together on the hydrocarbons issue. <coughs> How about convergences? <coughs> First, the Greek Cypriots need to decide whether they agree to all the convergences that were signed. We cannot cherry pick about convergences. Thank you. Peter. Um, Maybe your comment about the Anand plan and coming back to the Anand plan. Um, I didn't mean it with, with a blame to anyone, but I think that there are points in the Anand plan with which is suggested by citizens of both sides that could be, you know, maybe not as a package, but as singular points, um, be viable to be translated into solutions. Right. Well, nothing too much to add, but I mean. Um, on Anna, and it's the elephant in the room, isn't it? I mean, the fear passion in the room that surrounded it shows that. Uh, one may discuss Anna to say what to avoid about it as much as what's to resurrect about it, but it, you, you have to discuss it. It seems you cannot. It's one of the most important dates in, in post independent Cypriot history, isn't it? So, you know, we are going to discuss it. It can't simply be, it can't simply be left out of account. Um, the only other point I wanted to make, or maybe a couple, but the main one is when, when um, it was talked about successes, successes um, over the past 30 years, it seemed to me that these have all been very worthwhile, of course, but they haven't been about peace. I think you may have used the word peace. They haven't been about the solution. They've all made a very real contribution. And what they've done is to make the uh, abnormal normal. Mm. That's what they've done, and done it in some ways quite successfully, and of course the way Zenon spoke brought out the, the normality of the abnormality. Now, um, uh, hopefully in the end we're going to get out of that abnormality, but anyway, thank God, at least it's non-violent so far. So, great for those successes, but it's not a peace movement, you know. Uh, they don't constitute, the sum is not greater than the parts, is what I think had to be said. The third thing in my mind is that, sort of course, the, the biggest um, applause of the night came from my very good friend Kleakos, who, who made a sort of impassioned and definitive statement of what many Greek Cypriots understandably believe. But then, of course, we had a, a great rejection um, from a, a, a Turkish Cypriot uh, student from Oxford over, over, the, over the way there. And he showed, of course, the problem. But, you know, I mean, I, I rather suspect that. If, a, you know, if and ever a solution is made in the kind of context I've been talking about a bit earlier, it's going to be made like by people like Kleakos and his Turkish Cypriot theater. It's not going to be made by a prefabricated civic activist, with all due respect, <laughs> of the kind that you would in receipt of some Scandinavian grant. Very nice, <laughs> but going absolutely, going absolutely nowhere. And to come back, as we have done, to the Ulster situation, who made peace? A real peace mm -hmm. in Ulster. No, he did. <laughs> well, may I, he, of course, he played a part. It was it was McGuinness. It was Adams. Uh, it was uh, it was Robinson, and of course, it was the, the late lamented Ian Paisley. It was, if you like, the men of war, the men of war who made this peace in Cyprus. You know, the old warriors of that, and that 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 is on the whole a far more reliable way to settlement in these sorts of situations than looking for peace you know, through some soft folk sort of way. You know. <laughs> and one often feels that that is what is done, particularly outside Cyprus in academic events, <coughs> in places like the LSE. So I would have Cleopas as president of Cyprus, and he will one day perhaps be in a situation to do something real with his. Turkey Cypriot counterpart. 
probably is. <laughs> the weight of the world sits on your shoulders, Cleakos. You're not going to have the final word, by the way. I'm going to, so, yeah, go, go ahead. Thank you. Um, well, first of all, I'm not in receipt of any Scandinavian or other grants, but if anybody <laughs> would like to uh, furnish me with one, I'd be grateful for it. <laughs> but I'd have to make a declaration to my university in accordance with our, uh, our rules and procedures, because we live in an era of transparency and accountability, and that's regrettably missing in Nicosia with this peace process which is being conducted behind closed doors. I just wanted to respond to the comment that uh, the rule of law is a legal technicality, and I, I hear this a lot from people. It's not. The rule of law rests on moral foundations. It is a reaction to the suffering, the brutality, and the warfare that scarred the world during two uh, world wars in the 20th century. It's an attempt to promote good governance, ethical governance, and to protect the citizen from the arbitrary power of the state. My fear with politicians wielding power in Nicosia behind closed doors is that they will cook up a settlement that will convey power to the politicians to the detriment of the citizens. And that's why we need to see the documents that are passing the, the negotiating table in Nicosia to ensure that the human rights that we were given as a consequence of the brutality of the past are preserved and promoted. Remember, uh, ladies and gentlemen, that what we're trying to achieve in Cyprus is a settlement that, ironically, should be built on English principles of reasonableness, of fairness, of ethics and justice. And I asked a very simple question, and nobody is giving me the answer in Cyprus. Are we going to retain the common law and the principles of equity in the event of a settlement? Very simple question. The administration of justice is the means by which a citizen can protect their rights and allow a judge to act as the guarantor of, of, of the rights of the individual and of any settlement. Is the common law going to be preserved, or are we going to have a European-style or a Turkish-style constitutional court uh, imposed on Cyprus? I'll just end by, by going back to um, Martin Luther King. He said this, nothing could be more tragic for men, and I'll have to add women, because he admitted them, nothing could be more tragic than for men and women to, leave, to live in these revolutionary times and fail to achieve the new attitudes and the new mental outlooks that the new situation demands. Together, we must learn to live as brothers and sisters, or together, we will be forced to perish <coughs> as fools. Look at where Cyprus is situated. Look at what's going on around Cyprus. If we don't settle the Cyprus question on the principles of fairness and equality and the rule of law, we will perish. Thank you. Before we conclude, um, Bob has said that he wants to just have one final objection about his, his earlier comments. Yes, I just wanted to say that uh, in the context of my meaning of the use of the word disgrace was perhaps misconstrued. I don't think the vote was a disgrace. I think what was a disgrace was the Papadopoulos government urging a no vote for political ends. That's all. Okay, all right. Before I know there is going to be time after we finish, you know, if you want to come up and speak to some of the, the, the things, but we have to end on, on at this point. We, we are out of time. What I'd like to say is thank you so much to everyone for coming. Thank you to the speakers. Um, this is just a small taster. There are 30 chapters in the book, so I really suggest you, you take a look. There's um, fantastic contributions, and it's at a great knockdown price. £15 tonight, usually £60. <laughs> 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 <laughs>